Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Normally on Friday, we have our call-in Fridays, uh, and today is an unusual day because we have a guest that I'm going to be interviewing. Uh, Mr. Carl Grossman is with us, and without further ado, because we only have an hour, welcome to the show, Carl. Thank you for joining us. Always a pleasure to be with you. This is such a beautiful, I'm so grateful that you get to join us today because there's so much on my mind about this. First, let me introduce Carl, if for those of our listeners who don't know who he is. Carl is a full professor at the State University of New York College at Old Westbury. And he has been an investigative reporter for over 45 years and has written many excellent articles on, uh, really, I think, activism and uh, you know, exposing the lies of the nuclear industry and the leading causes of it. And I, and I add my own little thing. Uh, Carl was the man, the very reason that I actively got engaged and moved away from my computer and started figuring out what I could do because I heard him on Helen Caldicott's radio show right after Fukushima happened. And he, they were talking about it, and he said, look, this is so grave. Every person listening to this radio show needs to figure out what they can do. And we have been trained in our culture to tell ourselves no, and we need to start saying yes. I, I forget his exact words, but he said something like, listen to your gut. If your gut tells you you need to be doing something, go do it. So that's what I did, and that's this is three years later. Here I am. <laughs> Hi, Carl. <laughs> well, I, I'm so thrilled to hear that, to, uh, uh, to inspire somebody like yourself. Uh, it's just the most heartwarming uh, thing I've heard all week. Oh, good. Well, I have to say, when I found out about Fukushima, I actually, well, first, when I first heard about it, I believed the president when he said everything was fine, just fine. Then I had a nightmare in 2012 and realized, oh, my gosh, I went to the Internet and discovered, oh, my gosh, this place is raging. And, and since I heard you, I can honestly say uh, it is like unpeeling an onion of deceit and murder because that's I think that the nuclear people are murderers the I just read on Wednesday from the World Health Organization webpage the world it's not the World Health the World Nuclear Association they basically said nobody has died in Fukushima and that people are dying from the trauma of the evacuation and that uh, people are beginning to understand that exposure to radiation is just not that harmful I mean, the lies and the and, – and I actually identified who the person was at the head of the helm there. Her name is – this is a weird name, and I don't I, – I'm dying to ask you this ever since Wednesday, if you've heard of her. Agneta Rising. Do you know who she is? No, I, I've, I've not heard of that, uh, that nuclear Pinocchio. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, her line is um, – uh, that's, that, that's the pitch of the, uh, the nuclear establishment. I mean – they make the tobacco industry uh, look like pikers. Uh, I mean, uh, and, and that's going pretty far with uh, the cigarette companies saying, and doctor, remember when I was a kid, advertisements about more doctors like to smoke uh, this brand of cigarette or that brand of cigarette. And uh, that was a nightmare in and of itself. The, uh, uh, the promotion of tobacco uh, causing uh, addiction uh, through nicotine of millions and millions of people and so many deaths. And uh, along with it now comes, uh, uh, it's hard to say it's, uh, well, uh, maybe I shouldn't compare the two. It's like comparing uh, cancer and uh, and heart disease. Uh, but now you have these uh, liars for hire of the nuclear establishment uh, claiming uh, that uh, nuclear is fine. In fact, uh, uh, well, there's, a, there's a, a term they use called radiation hormesis, That's and right. listeners might want to look that up uh, on the Internet, on Google, or radiation, or look up hormesis, H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S, and that's this line of the nuclear industry, nuclear establishment within government, that actually uh, radiation exercises the immune system, and it's a helpful thing. I mean, these people should be judged on the basis of the... Uh, uh, the principles set out in the Nuremberg Tribunal. Uh, these people are, uh, and their companies and their agencies, their government agencies, 
are guilty of uh, uh, of killing on a mass scale. It's 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 just outrageous. And, and just and, to jump. And there, excuse me for jumping in here, but they're also responsible for brainwashing the leaders around the world that nuclear is okay. That's not only the leaders, but the people, the yeah. populace, and. Uh, They've moved into media through the years. So, for example, the the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power historically have been General Electric and Westinghouse. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, for years, here was GE uh, owning NBC. Uh, and I've written all kind of pieces about uh, what that resulted in. And Westinghouse, for years, owning CBS. Uh, not only a direct push into media, but I've... Well, my first book on this, Cover Up What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power, which in fact can now be downloaded for free from my website, carlgrossman.com. I spent pages and pages presenting the interlocking boards of directorates, people who are involved in the nuclear industry, and also on the boards of, of media companies. I mean, it's it's been a huge brainwashing effort, and... Uh, uh, it's, it would make Goebbels, the propaganda minister of, uh, for the for the Nazis, smile in his grave as to what the uh, the nuclear industry and the nuclear establishment uh, have done. Uh, out, utterly, utterly out, outrageous. And just let me add a footnote in terms of Fukushima. Uh, most people are not aware because media have not reported this to any extent. Uh, that uh, shortly before, well, in 2009, the uh, couple of years before the uh, the Fukushima catastrophe began, because it's ongoing, uh, two Japanese companies took over the nuclear operations of uh, GE and Westinghouse. Uh, Toshiba partnered with, well, it took over Westinghouse's nuclear operations, so it's now Toshiba Westinghouse, and uh, Hitachi, partnered with General Electric in its nuclear operation. So now the, the Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power are Japanese brands, which is another reason besides TEPCO, this, uh, this odorous, this outrageous uh, Japanese utility and the, uh, the nuclear mafia, they call it in Japan, within the Japanese government. Now you have the Coke and the traditional Coke and Pepsi of nuclear power Japanese brands, thus the uh, the Prime Minister of uh, Japan has been very busy in recent times trying to sell nuclear power plants elsewhere to other countries to spread to spread the the disasters to spread the tragedies to spread the the deaths that all result from uh, from nuclear power. You know, Carl, what really is astounding, we just saw this multi-billion dollar deal go down in England, right? And that's, a, again, like you said, the Coke and Pepsi, it was GE. What, the, what, is, what they're denying, this is, the, this is the incomprehensible thing for me, because we've had 70 years of their lies. Uh, Japan's population is dropping off the charts. It's going backwards. And that is most likely a direct result of bombardment with nuclear uh, materials and it's incomprehensible to me that the in every world government i mean it is dr john goffman you know i off i deem when i read dr john goffman's book i when he talked about that he studied the japanese people after the government re threw away all their documents on the women and children when they realized it was very bad for the that population he said when he after 20 years he realized that the government underreports the negative effects of radiation by 90% and immediately did denies radiation causes harm. Every government, this is the astounding thing, there is not one government agency anywhere in the world that acknowledges that nuclear is bad. They all deny radiation causes harm. They all underreport the negative. And in fact, to this day, like this morning, right before we got on the air, I mentioned to you about this article, and it is in the Washington Post. I, I read it on the Googles this morning. It's called Brain Cancer Replaces Leukemia as the Leading Cause of Cancer Deaths in Kids. We know that this is a direct result. These increases in cancer and leukemias are a direct result from radiation exposure. Well, it's 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 a, it's a leading cause. Uh, there, 
I mean, there's a toxic stew uh, that we've been been forced to uh, uh, to sit in. Uh, Toxic chemicals, uh, radioactivity, a synergy. And Rachel Carson was very strong on this, uh, relating uh, this is back uh, in the early 60s. She understood that you you put radioactivity and uh, toxic chemicals, the pesticides and uh, these horrible things that have been put in food that's in our water and so forth. You put it together and two and two don't equal four, they equal much more because of uh, of a synergy. I mean, I, I, I've written, uh, Google my name and put in cancer, that horrible, horrible word, and you'll right. see article after article by right. me. I've uh, written many, a good, many, many, many. Uh, a good uh, part of my, uh, I did a book called The Poison Conspiracy, charging that those who are supposed to protect us uh, don't at virtually every level from these people who are producing and uh, spreading poisons on the planet uh, and, and and cancer. In fact, in the book, The Poison Conspiracy, uh, there's a whole chapter on admitted causes of cancer where I cite, um, well, various government, in the late 1970s, you mentioned government agencies, there was a little bit of a, a not telling the truth, there was a little bit of a uh, change in that during the Carter administration. And he put together a number of uh, task forces and so forth on cancer. And I actually re- reprint as facsimiles their uh, summaries, their uh, their conclusions. And that essentially the conclusion is that cancer is a largely environmental disease, that most cancers are caused by um, by pollution. I mean, some of it is, is voluntary people smoking, but much of it is not voluntary at all it's 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 these poisons that have been spread into our environment and into our body and these are these are the the prime causes of cancer it's basically an environmental disease cancer was the number eight killer in this country back in 1900 a number eight way down on the list and these days it uh, it's coupled with heart disease as the two big killers now uh, the poisoners the uh, the, the nuclear uh, industry and nuclear establishment and the chemical companies, they say, well, no, no, it has to do with uh, uh, lifestyle and uh, diet and, and genetic disposition. Well, in, in part, uh, cancer has to do with, with that. Uh, and then they'll also say that uh, people are living longer and they've got to die of something, so they're dying of cancer. But that doesn't explain the epidemic of cancer that uh, we're seeing. I mean, who listening to this doesn't know someone who has cancer or has died from cancer? It's 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 it's, it's endemic. It's so widespread. And when you get to something like brain cancer, uh, as this leading childhood cancer now beyond leukemia, which is blood cancer, uh, this is children. This isn't people living longer. This is an epidemic of right. cancer. Among young people, and the reason, it's, it's not eating sour cream. Uh, it's not because you didn't do a, num- a good number of push-ups in the morning. It has to do with the uh, uh, the poison that's been put into our, our environment. And let me stress this, unnecessarily. I mean, there's some risks in life we all take. We jump into our car, we drive on the uh, interstate, and people are going fast, and they're cutting in, and they're speeding, and there's always a certain risk. Jump on an airplane, and there's a, there's a certain risk. But the risk that we're being put through uh, is totally unnecessary. There is no need for these toxic chemicals. There's no need for nuclear t- poisons. I mean, let me just jump in terms of toxic chemicals. Uh, for years, for years, the Monsanto company produced uh, polychlorinated biphenyls. Which, which it knew, which it knew, in fact, were carcinogenic for years, and and claimed that uh, there's no uh, alternative than to use uh, polychlorinated biphenyls uh, if we want to have an industrial society uh, needed as insulating fluid and so forth and so on. Well, finally, after the Environmental Protection Agency was created in the 70s, and after what was called the Yusho incident in Japan, where several people were poisoned. Uh, and a thousand got very ill because some PCBs getting into to, to rice oil. PCBs were banned, and now uh, they're not produced anymore here in this country. 
fine. Uh, and what's been used as the substitute for PCBs? Mineral oil. Nothing space age. Nothing fancy. It turned out that PCBs were never necessary. A, uh, a, a, another uh, substance could have been used all along, which was not carcinogenic, which wouldn't have caused the cancers that the PCBs have caused. Jumping to energy, to nuclear energy, I mean, we're really, it's an important point we're at now in terms of nuclear power because it's clear that safe, green, renewable energy technologies are are here today, and there's no need for nuclear. I mean, uh, symbolic of this, I think, is uh, just this... Uh, this summer, the the solar impulse, the solar powered airplane, flying ar ar around the world. Uh, the reports, and I have a bunch of them in front of me, about uh, now safe, green, renewable energy is uh, less. Exp here, here's one right here. Uh, climate action. Uh, you can get this on the web. Investment. The International Energy Agency has released a report showing that investment in new renewables has uh, outpaced uh, investment in uh, the traditional energy sources, uh, coal, oil, gas, and nuclear for the first time. Uh, here's a, a piece, and this is on a, uh, a financial page. America has seen 11 consecutive quarters with more than one gigawatt of solar photovoltaic PV photovoltaics uh, installed. I mean, if, if you go to speaking of the Internet, if, if listeners might want to go to the, uh, the web page of, uh, it's a wonderful organization, the Solutions Project, the Solutions Project, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a, a group which, uh, let me g give the uh, URL, http colon slash slash the Solutions Project, Dot org, and uh, it was founded by you know, a, a bunch of important figures, including uh, uh, Mark Jacobson, who is a professor at Stanford. The actor uh, Mark Ruffalo uh, uh, is uh, a, was a co-founder. In any case, what what it's been uh, promoting and pushing uh, is 100% renewable uh, energy. And in other words, what the Solutions Project is saying is that it's it's feasible. It's all here today. We can we can have energy we can live with. We can produce all the energy we need with safe, green, renewable energy, like uh, like particularly solar, uh, wind power, uh, and you can go tidal power. You can go wave power. You can go on and on. Uh, with, uh, with it's a bonanza. It's a windfall of safe green new, uh, power that uh, we have now available us to us, rendering nuclear power as well as coal and oil, which cause uh, climate change and are no good uh, to and uh, and gas. This fracking situation is outrageous. Uh, what's that do? What that is doing uh, in the production of, of gas and oil to the water uh, around the nation, indeed around the world, as it's being pushed around the world. So uh, there's a green path that can be taken, and the advances are enormous. Well, when I first started it in that book, Cover Up, What You're Not Supposed to Know About Nuclear Power, I wrote it after the Three Mile Island accident, convinced me that uh, catastrophic accidents, nuclear plant accidents, were uh, going to be happening with some regularity, and I sat down, spent a year, wrote that book, and as I say, just go to www. Carl Grossman, one word, call with a K, Grossman. dot com. Hit the button which says books, and you can get a download of that, courtesy of the publisher, for free. But when I wrote that book, solar power was uh, well, in terms of efficiency, the relationship between sunlight and how much wattage is produced, they were it was in the single digits. Uh, right. Just last week, a company called Insulite, Insulite, a new startup company, has developed solar photovoltaic panels with 36% efficiency. I mean, the best uh, that has been uh, uh, developed for space use has been 25% efficiency. And, and the SunPower company last year began producing 
panels with 24% efficiency, but now we see 36% efficiency. What that means is that you need far fewer, uh, far less panels. space right. uh, for the panels. And, and, and really, this is just, the, I think, the beginnings of efficiency. In terms of wind power, it's, it's just, just amazing. I mean, the Europeans have moved into offshore wind, which is really appropriate for areas uh, which are uh, well settled, densely populated, including where I live here. I, I live on Long Island in New York, and uh, we're 100 miles from Manhattan, but there's a lot of people who live on Long Island, millions of people, count Brooklyn and Queens, 8 million people. So what's being developed off Long Island, uh, offshore wind. In fact, the first offshore wind farm in the U.S. is to be completed in coming weeks. It's off eastern Long Island. It's near a place called Block Island. And one of the towns on Long Island, uh, East Hampton, uh, recently announced that it's going to go 100% renewable by, you know, not 20 years from now, 10 years from now, four years from now, by 2020. And, in fact, any town in America, any state in America, with a different mix, uh, some would be heavy on offshore wind, some onshore wind, some solar, some uh, uh, tidal power, some wave power, some biomass. And so combined with energy efficiency, uh, the world period could uh, could uh, go a hundred percent renewable uh, oh well in fact uh, here's an article uh, that's uh, uh, on the solutions project talking about over 130 countries could go uh, 139 countries could be a hundred percent renewable uh, uh, in coming years and in any case these these Oh, poisons! Uh, these 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 toxic substances, these toxic processes that are being are killing people, uh, and cancer is 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 the, is the big form of death from these from this, this monkey wrench thrown into nature. The, this is not like getting on an airplane. It's not like getting into a car and going on the interstate. Uh, risks that you kind of have to take. These are risks we do not need to take. No. And on top of that, I mean, it's almost as if they know that we don't need to take the risk, but it's as if, I mean, really, all of these renewable energies have really been suppressed by, as you say, the Coca-Cola and Pepsi of, you know, I mean, there's been lots of money out there. I know that at my own university here, University of Oregon, uh, I met a girl who told me that her professors, in fact, two students have argued with me that I am grossly misinformed, that nuclear is just not that harmful. Now, this is what they're getting at an education at, the, at a university level. They are being trained and groomed to accept nuclear death. And that is the most... Now, let me ask you this. Now, are, do you... This I just opened up this page to the... Um, I've never actually even heard of this, and thank you for sharing it with me, the Solutions Project. Yes. How, how is it that these, uh, or I mean, this is a really awesome page, and I do suggest everybody go there because it really does get a lot of, give us a lot. Is it coming, is it out of the Stanford University, or is it just a group of people who are doing it? Do you know these people? Oh, no, no, it's, 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 it's a, a, a major uh, effort. It's, it's a major effort to do 100% renewable in this country and around the world. Yes, but uh, as I look at this, how is the key that none of was Mark Jacobson, who, who was an absolute giant, but uh, uh, they're getting funding from terrific foundations, the Park Foundation, the Musk Foundation, so they got some bucks to, to do what needs to be done in terms of trying to educate people. Oh, and also to, uh, I mean, they're just not sitting there doing reports. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, the organization, the Solutions Project, has just began. I mean, it just began uh, something called the Fighter Fund. Uh, let me just des describe it. A new grant-making program for community-based groups on the front lines of the fight for clean energy and climate justice. Thus, if uh, what you're speaking from in Eugene, which has to be one of the most wonderful cities in the entire world. I love Eugene, Oregon. 
Uh, the There's someone who environmental groups uh, in, in Eugene, including environmental groups at the university, and I've spoken at the University uh, of Oregon and Eugene, and I, I know that there's a very active environmental movement. You can, I think, get help from um, from the fighter fund and get involved with the solutions uh, project. I mean, years ago, the no, uh, the, the saying was uh, uh, active today or radioactive tomorrow. Well, uh, people have been active, and the the the, uh, the nightmarish dream of a thousand nuclear plants. <laughs> that Richard Nixon uh, spoke about for the United States uh, in the year 2000. That hasn't come to pass. We're less than 100, and they've been closing down one after another. Or they, these old, decrepit plants just <coughs> can, can hardly function at all. Uh, but um, still, we've gotten very radioactive today. All, all around the world, these plants have, uh, and these disasters, Chernobyl, <coughs> Three Mile Island, Fukushima, have uh, have caused uh, enormous death. I, uh, in fact, when you go to my web, people will go to my website. You'll see a um, a video. Uh, I have a syndicated television show called Enviro Close Up with Carl Grossman, and I uh, interview. And you can just click on. It's right on the actual home page of the website. Uh, an interview with Dr. Jeanette Sherman, and she was the editor of a of such an important book just done a few years ago by a group of European scientists led by Dr. Alexei Yaplikov, who actually is, is the Rachel Carson of, um, of, of Russia. And they, uh, on the basis of data now available, conclude uh, that the death toll just so far from the 1986 Chernobyl accident is 985,000. Uh, many of those hundreds of thousands, many of those, uh, deaths occurred in, in Russia, in Belarus, and in the Ukraine, with the Chernobyl plant uh, uh, still sitting there, with some other plants next to it, which are still uh, outrageously running. Uh, but in any case, some of that uh, death involved wherever the fallout from Chernobyl went. And that was one nuclear plant which, which, uh, which exploded. Here in, in, in Fukushima, now over five years ago, you had three and I'm sure everybody has seen those those images on television of those plants exploding, and uh, that the fallout from those nuclear plants uh, uh, into the atmosphere, and particularly into the Pacific Ocean, and moving uh, in the ocean and getting concentrated in the ocean, because with uh, with radioactivity getting on well vegetation, for example, little fish eat the vegetation, bigger fish eat the the smaller fish, and the next thing you know, you're having some sushi in Portland. And, uh, well, right. I wouldn't want to have some sushi in Portland these days, honestly. Uh, I, so, I stopped uh, eating fish completely. I've stopped well, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a horror, but, I mean, when we deal with these issues, there's, there's really, you know, we can not eat fish. Uh, we can try to, uh, you know, be in terms of the Pacific, uh, the Atlantic, uh, I'm here on the East Coast, so I'm a little luckier. But, I mean, there's nowhere to hide. Uh, I love snorkeling. Absolutely love snorkeling. We've gone through the years of the Caribbean, but in the last several years, you go snorkeling now in the Caribbean. I'm talking about the, the prime places for snorkeling and seeing life, uh, technicolor life underwater. It, 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 the, the coral reefs have been bleached uh, to Snow White. Uh, so, Carl, it, it, let me let me ask you some questions about this project because one of my pet peeves is that the people who say they are providing us alternative energy and giving us new ideas, blah blah blah, all that other stuff, like this team on the uh, this project, what's it called, the Solutions Project? Solutions Project. I have not heard a single one of these characters speak out and say Fukushima is raging out of control. We must get on it. They all, everybody want. this is, I mean, honestly, we need these leaders to start talking publicly about the harm that is caused by nuclear it's not enough for me a li on a little tiny radio station, and I'm actually going to reach out to these people to see if I can interview with them and ask them these questions directly. But frankly, it seems to be a concerted effort among the alternative energy providers or people that say we're going to provide good, clean energy, and it is really good and really clean. On one hand, on, on the right hand, the 
correct path. They're providing us uh, alternatives and solutions, but not one of them wants to come out publicly and say, hey, our lives are being threatened by nuclear pollution as we speak. You know, 68% well, I, 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 of tritium in New York City yeah. going into the Hudson Bay. That yeah. is an but, outrage that we let Chuck Schumer slam through that how much money is New York going to be forced to keep open two crippled nuclear power plants? Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you in terms of so many of these sort of greenwashing operations, uh, but I, I, let me tell you, the Solutions Project is quite, quite different. I mean, uh, you have people like Leonardo DiCaprio, who is a... a, a there's some big names. I just open this up. Like there is, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Josh Jones, Fox. Josh Fox, who did the Gasland yeah. series, Gasland One and Two, uh, in terms of challenging fracking. Uh, I mean, these are excellent, excellent people. I'm on the board myself of some organizations. If people are looking for other totally solid, good green organizations that I would recommend. I'm on the board of the group called Beyond Nuclear. Just go to beyondnuclear.org. That's so totally solid group. Uh, I'm on the board of the Radiation and Public Health Project, and the stress of Radiation and Public Health Project uh, has to do with you don't need a catastrophic accident for a nuclear plant to emit radioactive poisons. They do it, they do it all the time. It's, it's, uh, these are routine emissions permissible. This is what the Gov Nuclear Regulatory Commission describes these emissions as permissible emissions. And the Radiation and Public Health Project that I've been associated with for many years uh, has connected these permissible emissions to cancer clusters around every, every nuclear plant. Go to the Nuclear Information and Resource Service, uh, NEARS in Washington, NEARS.org. I was on its board for, for many years. Totally solid, totally good. Uh, and uh, so where are these always, go to, yeah, always go to Greenpeace. Greenpeace well, is solid. Now, in terms of what you're talking about, uh, the attempt to greenwash, the attempt to cover up, I will point to my state here in New York State and something that's recently happened uh, in, along those lines. Uh, here in New York State a few months ago, the governor, Andrew Cuomo, advanced something called a, a clean energy standard. And some of the, uh, the more, well, how can I put it, the, uh, the less militant uh, environmental groups thought, oh, that sounds great, clean energy standard. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't get into it too deeply, clearly, because it turned out that Andrew Cuomo's clean energy standard, which would enable New York to have, New York State to have half of its energy from renewable sources by 2030, it's uh, 50 by 30 is, is the slogan, uh, that sounds good, but what Andrew Cuomo has done is include four nuclear plants upstate under the listing of clean energy, the Fitzpatrick plant, uh, the Jenna plant, and uh, the Nine Mile uh, uh, Point. There's two of them there, Nine, nine Mile plants, uh, four nuclear plants. And he claims, he claims, uh, Andrew Cuomo, well, we've got to keep these old, decrepit nuclear plants upstate New York going because they provide uh, jobs, about 2,000 jobs. Well, Professor Mark Jacobson of the Solutions Project, uh, again, out of Stanford, on the West Coast, he's done a, a wonderful rebuttal and analysis of that claim, uh, and he concludes that, in fact, if New York State uh, would say no to these nuclear plants upstate, what, what Cuomo accomplished here was to get the New York State Public Service Commission to agree to his uh, his claim that these nuclear plants uh, should be kept going, and because they're not economical anymore, to have the the taxpayers of New York State uh, commit to a seven point six billion dollar bailout, seven point six billion dollars. Well, Professor Jacobson has shown, and you can you can see his analysis. It's it's, it's on the internet. Uh, in fact, if we would commit to real green, real renewable, real uh, safe and clean power in New York State fully, uh, not partner with nuclear and say that that's green, we could develop uh, 80,000 jobs instead of a right. couple of thousand jobs, 40 times more. So 
I think what you're pointing to, some of these organizations that uh, are weak, are not strong, uh, that's a problem. But I think what we all have to do is to gain some knowledge, understand what the good groups are, and uh, obviously not believe the malarkey, the baloney of the uh, of the nuclear Pinocchios, or, or, or the Andrew Cuomos, who uh, uh, apparently have, uh, have oh, accepted their baloney, and uh, move ahead. Again, active today, not radioactive tomorrow. Uh, that has to still be our motto, and we has to we have to uh, we have to organize, we have to act, we have to move. You know what I think? Actually, what we need to say is we're radioactive today. Uh, organized, to, uh, organ, you know, radi- we are radioactive. That's the that's the denial. This is the point. The, and I actually am going to reach out to this project, and actually, I'm going to actually probably put in a grant with this because I uh, just to help form with Mimi German, No Nukes Northwest. We're an actual official. Yeah. Uh, 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 nonprofit. We got our nonprofit designation, and our goal is to get the Columbia Generating Station shut down because it is a danger. Frankly, not just to the Northwest, but to the entire uh, Northern Hemisphere, because we're only 15 miles from Hanford at the Columbia Generating Station. Which means, if we had a nuclear meltdown there, which is you know, they all will at some point. It's not a matter of when. It's 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 a matter of when, not if. Uh, there, if anything happened there, because it's only 15 miles away from Hanford, nobody could get into the Hanford facilities to tend them for at least two weeks, which would cause them to explode and bye bye North America. I mean, it is a clear and present danger. What's happening? They they this is the insanity of the nuclear industry, Carl. That they're sort of like tiptoeing and dancing and hope that they can keep spinning. It reminds me of that guy on the Ed Sullivan show who had those plates spinning. You know how they would run from this gun and run to that one and then right. get this one and get I remember this one. Him. That's kind of what they remind me of because they are now in a they're all, it's like what happened with San Onofre, uh, in San Onofre where they wanted to put in the wrong part to save money. I mean it's an incomprehensible lack of regard for not just human life, all life on our planet, it is just incomprehensible to me that the people running this know they're lying. They know they're lying. They must know they're lying because the evidence is conclusive. And they all end up with cancer. Like, I, I, you know, their children have problems. Up in Hanford, near Hanford, there was, oh, there's an epidemic of microencephaly, which now we're causing the Zika virus. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, a, it's like you said, that it's like they're trying to baffle them with bullshit. You know what I mean? Like they're yep. trying to throw so much at them that you can't, you can't point your finger at nuclear, but you can't point your finger away from it. So you have to put all of the poisons into the stew and that's what we've created on our planet and that's the struggle that we get this is what this is the legacy we're handing our children because we are radioactive today active tomorrow we are going to be forced to be active tomorrow if we want to have life on our planet at all Uh, i I begin the book cover up and just a few sentences let me read you have not been informed about nuclear power you have not been told and that has been done on purpose Keeping the public in the dark was deemed necessary by the promoters of nuclear power if it was to succeed. Those in government, science, and private industry who have been pushing nuclear power realized that if people were given the facts, if they knew the consequences of nuclear power, they wouldn't stand for it. And, and, and I go on. And incidentally, uh, the book, uh, in, in, in terms of, uh, well, the first page, I quote from a very important book, uh, and a chapter in it, I quote from Deuteronomy, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse, therefore choose life that you and your descendants may live. And that, I think, wow. is, the, is, is the key issue. Generation after generation uh, in, in human history have, have faced, uh, uh, well, forces of darkness, forces of death, and forces of, uh, of light. And uh, we just have to... Uh, fight the forces of darkness. The issue here, some issue, is that the scale of destruction is so enormous. Uh, Albert Einstein, in his book, Out of My Later Years, this is in 1946, he wrote it, after the war and the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan, he said he never would have lifted pen to paper 
if he knew, and he's talking about uh, the Nazis not getting the atomic bomb. I mean, they tried, uh, and that's why Einstein in '39 wrote a letter to Franklin Roosevelt, the president, telling him about fission having just been done in, in, in Germany, and we'd have to, uh, he felt, uh, fight fire with fire and develop nuclear technology before the, the Nazis did. But the Germans didn't get there. Uh, but meanwhile, what occurred was uh, this, huge, uh, this huge establishment. I've been using the word establishment. What I mean by that is during the war, during the Manhattan Project, Places like Hanford, down the down the road from you. In fact, at Hanford, the first first reactors were built to produce plutonium. They didn't know how exactly they'd have enough fuel for nuclear weapons. They would enrich as much uranium as they can get their hands on, because only uranium two thirty five is fissile and will explode. Not uranium two thirty eight and ninety nine point three percent of uranium naturally occurring is uranium-238, so then they built Oak Ridge in Tennessee to to enrich, so-called enrich, uh, the uranium, get a lot of U-235 in it, so you could get the Hiroshima bomb was 90% U-235, and it worked. But up in Hanford, near where you are, uh, there they built a, a series of reactors to produce plutonium. Is uh, when, they, when there's fission, that U-238 grabs a neutron, and transmutes to plutonium-239, which in and of itself is fissile. It'll uh, be usable in a, a nuclear weapon, and it was used in Nagasaki. And all our atomic bombs, basically, since uh, that time have been uh, 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 plutonium bombs. Uh, plutonium is the trigger in the hydrogen bomb. But what I want to stress is that it wasn't just the technologies that were developed during uh, the war. Uh, but a vested interest. I mean, GE and Westinghouse uh, previously uh, pointed to, they were big contract. I said they got into the nuclear business during World War II, during the Manhattan Project. Our government, the Manhattan Project, secretly contracted with Westinghouse uh, and, and GE as, as, uh, to work with the, uh, uh, the folks at these various national secret laboratories that were set up, uh, the most important, of course, was Los Alamos, uh, Oak Ridge, what's now called Argonne. In any case, by the end of the war, there was this infrastructure. There was uh, huge numbers of people employed. There was uh, had been billions spent uh, in 1940s dollars, and these folks were looking for well to continue the vested interest, and they could right. show they the could. Cash uh, cow. It was a, it, well, it was they a, could. They, they didn't want to go back to teaching physics at the University of Tennessee. They wanted to stay uh, in their nice uh, positions at Los Alamos or, or Hanford or Oak Ridge. Or, and then there was the other national labs to, that were created. Uh, Lawrence Livermore, Edward Teller, felt that uh, what we need is the uh, the super, the hydrogen bomb. And uh, Oppenheimer, the director, scientific director at Los Alamos, he didn't like this. I mean, he tells at one point Teller, at the end of the war, after the dropping of the bomb, uh, this is this is Oppenheimer. We physicists have sinned. I mean, he he put it on a moral level, but uh, Teller didn't know from sin, and ultimately he split from Oppenheimer. In fact, he testifies against. He becomes a, a real, real uh, uh, horrible, uh, uh, aggressive foe of Oppenheimer. But in any case, they give him the government his own last, uh, national laboratory, Lawrence Livermore, which incidentally both Lawrence Livermore and Los Alamos are still run by the University of California. You were mentioning before academia be kind of being yes. pulled into the establishment. That has happened, too. That has happened, uh, too. In any case, they, they were looking for things to do with nuclear. We could build more nuclear weapons and ultimately 30,000 atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs were built, but what else could we do with nuclear technology to perpetuate uh, this this endeavor? And there comes nuclear-powered airplanes, nuclear-powered rockets, food irradiation, nuclear power plants. Actually, the concept of a nuclear power plant was based on those plutonium production reactors at Hanford. There was so much heat involved in the well, doing the fission, uh, having the uranium-238 pick up neutrons, become plutonium. 239 and so forth, so much heat involved that the early documentation, and I've written a lot about this, talks about dual-purpose reactors, reactors like the ones at Hanford, which would produce plutonium, 
and as a side product, produce electricity. A, a, a major national laboratory, which was a national nuclear laboratory, also established by the Atomic Energy Commission, which in 1946 the Manhattan Project was turned into, the Atomic Energy Commission, was right here where I live on Long Island, called so, Brookhaven me, National let me, Laboratory. Let me stop you there a minute, Carl. You're telling me the Manhattan Project was turned into the AEC, which is now the NRC? Well, yes, it, uh, the Manhattan Project, which was the secret thing uh, during the I war, mean, became the in 46. the are still suffering from that. There is uh, from Manhattan waste. Project Waste, the Atomic yes. Energy Commission. And then in 1974, the Atomic Energy Commission was disbanded by Congress. This was amazing, considering how the U.S. Congress... Had, They've been handmaidens of the nuclear industry for so many years and nuclear establishment. Uh, and in 74, then, the nuclear – well, the problem with the Atomic Energy Commission, as Congress finally acknowledged, was mm. that it was set up to both promote and regulate nuclear technology. Right. And that was a conflict of interest. So they created a Nuclear Regulatory Commission to do the regulation, and then uh, it took a few years a Department of Energy to do the promotional role. Nevertheless, both the NRC and the DOE equally uh, oh, oh, cheerleaders for nuclear technology. The NRC, had, like the AEC, never denied a construction or operating license for any nuclear power plant anywhere, anytime. And just if I could jump back quick to Einstein, in out of my later years, uh, he not only writes, I wouldn't have signed that letter, I wouldn't send Senator Roosevelt if I knew the Germans wouldn't have gotten the bomb, but he talks, talks about humanity and destruction and how through, through time, Einstein writes, people have been led in the wrong direction. But, he goes on, when you talk about nuclear technology, the scale of destruction, the scale of destruction is so much greater than humanity has ever seen. Ever. Uh, I, I, I think the whole thing kind of is summed up uh, by, well, Admiral Hyman Rickover. Uh, he is regarded as the father of the nuclear navy. He, in fact, was in charge of construction of the first nuclear plant built in the U.S. shipping port in Pennsylvania, a big nuclear promoter, a uh, big pusher of nuclear. And then finally he saw the light. And in 1982, when he, and this is in cover-up, what you're not supposed to know about nuclear power, uh, his speech to a committee of Congress when he retires from the Navy, and what he says was a few billion years ago, there was so much naturally occurring radioactivity on this planet that life could not exist. And only after those poisons, the cesium and the strontium and all these horrible poisons, went through their half-lives and wow. went through their hazardous lifetimes, could life could life begin on Earth? Now, he says, this is Rickover, not Greenpeace or Beyond Nuclear or the Solutions Project. This is this guy who was this great nuclear promoter. By having these nuclear power plants, by having these nuclear reactors, we are creating the very poisons, the very poisons that precluded life on Earth. And there, Rickover goes on, I think the human race is going to wreck itself and we have to shut all these things down. We've got to close them down. We've got to outlaw nuclear reactors. And Rickover had it all right. The only addition, I, I would say, is you can't be anthropomorphic here. It's not only humanity, people right. who are suffering and will suffer from nuclear technology. It's other forms of life. I mean, they say cockroaches can absorb 200 times the radioactivity that people can. But I don't think that we should allow cockroaches to inherit the earth. I think what we have to do is just what Rickover said in 82. Shut them down and shut them down now, right and now. Make it and as I stress, no yes. need for any of them. No, no. You know, the World Nuclear Association actually formed in 1975, and they were funded. They call themselves a .org, but they're not. I've done some little bit of history looking into it the last couple of days. They're actually a private consortium of nuclear promoters and nuclear companies that their mission statement is to get to international influencers and give them uh, informative documentation about the benefits of nuclear industry. 
industry, which means they hire paid nuclear. This is why I am going to start using Agneta Rising's name, and I've decided, like in in uh, St. Louis, Don Slater is the CEO of uh, Republic Services, right, Slager. And I uh, am going to follow the advice of Dr. John Goffman. Don't call these companies like General Electric, General Electric. We need to find the names of the people in charge because they need to be publicly humiliated because they are destroying the planet. Literally, as you just said, they are literally right. dis- and they're hiding behind these names of the corporation, but the corporations are not they are the people behind them. They're not just the corporation. I mean, as much as our the you know they want to say corporations are people, they're not. The human beings behind them are the people making the decisions, and we're really at a critical phase in this whole issue. And well, I, I, we've, been, we've been critical for so so long. Well, uh, I mean, yes. I, I had the honor to know John Goffman, Dr. John Goffman, wow. uh, a great. Uh, I mean, and, and for listeners who aren't familiar with him. He actually was involved with the Manhattan Project. He was involved with uh, the he discovery helped, he helped of, 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 of various I- isotopes, and he went on to become associate director at Lawrence Livermore. Uh, and then, as as the years the, the years went by, he realized, like Rickover, what he was involved. In fact, like a, in an interview I did with with Dr. Goffman a few years before he died, uh, he speaks about his, his uh, among the epiphanies was, uh, believe it or not, the U.S. was planning to build, this is uh, to perpetuate the nuclear establishment, uh, one of the ways, the Panatomic Canal. The Panatomic Canal. In fact, in my book cover-up, you will see Atomic Energy Commission uh, graphs and, and, and uh, descriptions of how what they would do would be put a... a, a Scores and scores of nuclear devices across the isthmus of Panama, and s- set them off. And so, it wouldn't be like uh, b- digging a canal. You'd have all these nuclear devices exploding and uh, creating uh, the basis for a nuke. The Panatomic Canal, it was called. In fact, Congress uh, uh, supported this project and so forth. And Dr. Goffman went down to this area. He told me to. Uh, uh, the people were quite upset, as you could imagine, with the uh, uh, the prospects of, of of all these nuclear devices going off where they lived. I mean, the fallout would be enormous. And Goffman, he, he was on assignment for the Atomic Energy Commission, totally sympathized. And he began to understand and understand fully uh, the, uh, the the horrors of nuclear technology. One of his greatest books. Everybody should read it. Is Poisoned Power, yes. a great book which he wrote with Arthur Templin, who also worked at at Lawrence or Lawrence Livermore, uh, a giant um, uh, among the, the the folks who were in the nuclear establishment, but people of conscience. Uh, and also, it's important to note that Goff, Dr. Goffman was not not just a PhD; he also was an MD. He also was a medical doctor committed to. Uh, to the lives of people. I mean, he realized that on the other, other side of things, he was involved in a establishment which uh, was into, into the deaths of people and was, just like you were talking about, denying that, uh, saying it's not happening, it won't happen, it can't happen, uh, just the to... The nuclear uh, priesthood, uh, as Dr. Alvin Weinberg said, they call themselves well, the nuclear I, priesthood. He proudly, he proud, uh, Weinberg, to Alvin Weinberg, who did not, leave the uh, the nuclear industry. He was the director at Oak Ridge National Laboratory for many years, and I heard him with my ears, my own ears at Brookhaven National Laboratory, which was set up by the Atomic Energy Commission here on Long Island in 1947, specifically developed civilian uses of nuclear technology. I remember him addressing uh, scientists. Uh, I, I kind of snuck into his address at Brookhaven National Laboratory, and there, several hundred uh, nuclear scientists at that laboratory smiled as he talked about how there was a mistake, he argued, using uranium in nuclear power plants. We should have gone right to plutonium because it would be easier to create as a fuel, but it's, uh, it's terribly toxic. I mean, plutonium has been described as the most toxic uh, radioactive substance, period. So it would be a problematic to use plutonium as, as, as the major energy source. But then he looks out into the group and he says, but we, we, the atomic priesthood, could manage all this. I mean, what madness, what 
yes. absolute, absolute craziness. And just let me add, though, on a positive note, there were originally, through the years, three nuclear reactors at Brookhaven National Laboratory spreading cancer here on where I live on Long Island. Uh, tritium, uh, Long Island is dependent on a sole source aquifer, uh, the water un uh, underneath our feet. Tritium was leaking for decades from reactors at Brookhaven National Laboratory. But finally, the people of Long Island got together uh, from, from the grassroots to uh, notable people. Alec Baldwin, the actor Alec Baldwin, Baldwin, very active in this effort. Christy Brinkley was a key to this effort. And, and people fought nuclear operations at, again, what was to be the big national laboratory to do... Um, uh, civilian nuclear power, and all those reactors at Brookhaven National Laboratory are now shut down. They're closed. In fact, there's nothing nuclear here on Long Island, period. It's a nuclear-free zone. Why? Because of people acting and moving. Now, the, the bad news is that what the Department of Energy did uh, with uh, the end of the nuclear operations at Brookhaven National Laboratory was to create a new national laboratory uh, out in Idaho. Uh, out in Idaho, there was a, they used to call it Argonne West. Uh, Argonne National Laboratory in Illinois had this operation in Idaho, and also the, the naval reactor testing station in Idaho. So after the thing happened at Brookhaven Lab, the, uh, the enormous protest and uh, a so revolution they just, moved it really to the they just moved it to the Midwest. Well, they, they, uh, which is very common. In fact, yeah. you know and what, I, I've written a lot, a lot about this. I have to cut well, us off. We have 30 seconds. I just looked at the clock. This has been extremely <laughs> compelling. <laughs> Look, I want to thank you. Our guest has been Dr. Uh, Carl Grossman. He is a professor. He has his own carlgrossman.com. You can read all about it. Please go to his website, download his book, and read his book. Thank you, Carl. I hope you'll join us again. I joined us again, and the last time I was in Eugene, I gave a talk at the university on nuclear power. Love to do it again.